we'll be there in just a minute. I, I, this, uh, when I hear certain people talk and I watch the things that go on within you, and I, you know, and I appreciate social media. It opened up uh, a window into your lives so I could tell kind of what was going on. You know, some of us, bless our hearts, we can't stay quiet enough about our lives. We got to let people know about um, <clears throat> stuff and what we're doing and uh and, I, you know, and it's funny to me, it's kind of like now I'm getting to see what God has been seeing all along, yeah. what God's heard all along. Amen. And I realize a lot of it is what we would call misunderstandings. Amen. And I would call this, I must have missed, I am I S something, I must have missed something in life. The word miss is a prefix. It means wrong or bad, a lack of misunderstanding, to have a lack of understanding. You didn't understand what just happened. Uh, oftentimes, I will tell people, don't text. Uh, call them. Let them hear your intentions, what you really mean, what you're saying. Don't just send it, because sometimes text can seem cold. It can seem indifferent. So let them know what you mean by that. So it's important that you understand intentions. In my life, I, I, I won't go through a lot of the things that I've gone through, but I can tell you this. There was a day in 1993, I wanted to start a church here in this area. And when I just started to do that, uh, what had happened was the pastor that I served at that time, he wrote out the plans of his new church that was going to be on Beltway 8 and I-10. And he said, one day you're going to pastor this. And I knew in my heart that, uh, that God wanted me to travel for three years. That was in 1990. And uh, I didn't know how long I would travel, but I, I wanted to be an evangelist. And, and he, it was a funny thing because he said to me, do you think you could make it on the road? And that was kind of what my dad asked me when I decided to go into ministry. Do you think you can make it out on, in ministry? And, and to me, it didn't matter how much money I was making. I knew if God called me to do it, he'd provide for me. And so I became, of course, a, a youth minister in 1986. And 1990, I, I went out as an evangelist. I've always had a heart to evangelize. And so I had to disappoint him and let him know, I can't do this. I, I, I can't take that. It sounds great. It sounds lucrative. It sounds stable. It sounds all that. But everything I'm fixing to do, it seems contrary to that. And of course, while I was on the road, there was an adoption of two children and then later three. So I saw God's hand in it. So many great things happened and made so many great relationships. But then when we started the church in 1993 here in this area, I was condemned by that pastor. He uh, he just didn't understand. He was mad. He didn't. There was a misunderstanding, Kenny. And and the words went out that uh, nothing I would do would ever last. And and I, hurtful things were said from out of there because to the point was, I told him, I didn't want to, uh, to take the church. I wanted you to give it to my brother-in-law because he served here so faithfully. By the way, he is still the pastor of that church now. And so um, I, I looked at the misunderstanding, and it was hurtful. But before that man died, before that pastor died, I ended up being his pastor. And the misunderstanding was taken care of, Tommy, and he ended up in my church. And, and so all, it turned out as a good thing. Can I get an amen? So I understand misunderstandings, and of course, uh, your life can be that way. A lot of folk, particularly when you when you start serving God, because people say, "How do you serve an invisible God? How do you, you're praying to a God you can't see?" And and of course, we have seen miracles, but how do you live without God? How do you live without knowing Jesus? How how do you handle? How do you have hope for tomorrow? Amen. How how can you live knowing that if you go into the grave, all you're going to be is worm food? I don't want to live that way. I want to live with a hope for eternity. Can I get an amen? Amen. So when I walk through Scripture, I realize that this happened all through the Word of God, that people misunderstood others. Joseph, we talked about Joseph for months, his confrontation with his brothers over that coat of many colors of favor and a misunderstanding dreams. He shared his dreams. He was sold as a slave to Potiphar, oversaw his home, ran from his wife, left his coat, spent the next two years, amen, at an all-male camp called prison, all because of an act poorly interpreted. Amen. He was misunderstood. Understood. David killed a Goliath. You know that story. He soothed Saul. Amen. He was a soother with music. He would put on a music, probably played some third day for him or something like that, and calmed Saul down and made him feel a little bit better. Saul, Saul heard all of that. But his, his intentions were exaggerated by King Saul. Amen. He had no understanding. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 8 says that Saul was very angry with David. There was a refrain. After he came back, jealousy often causes misunderstandings. When you become je that little green monster. And so here is David. It's not his fault. I mean, oh, it was not your fault you were born pretty. 
It's not so, you're not your fault you're good looking. It's not your fault that, that, that you are very athletic. It's not your fault. Amen. God just intended for you to deal with it properly. Can I get an amen? Amen. So when I look at Scripture, it says, uh, keep reading here in 1 Samuel. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They credited David. And so to Pete, when he came back, Saul was looking on his phone. How many know we look like? I look on my phone on Sunday afternoon and Monday just to see if y'all got something out of church. And if you dared post it, and if something good, oh, that's what preachers do. We don't act like we do it, but we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to check it out and see how. Like, did we do a good job on Sunday? Did you catch a, rev- a heavy revy? Amen. Did you get hold of something? Amen. Well, you moved. How, we, so we're going to check it out. So here's Saul. He's checking out his, his, his iPhone, and he looks on there, and he sees that his uh, life has got a 1,000 likes. A thousand likes. I got a thousand likes out of the kingdom. But this little 15, 16 year old kills Goliath. He comes back. He got 10,000 likes. Oh, there ain't nothing like seeing somebody else get more likes than you. Or it can make, oh, don't, don't look at me like that. Sad, the saddest suicide letter I've ever read. A woman wrote two words. She took her life, left a note, and the note said, they said. They said. See, we are influenced. We can laugh about it, but we're influenced by social media. We're influenced by the likes and the not likes. And just like Saul, when, when, when David got a thousand, amen, or, or excuse me, when Saul got a thousand, David got 10,000. Amen. It goes on. He thought, but me with only a thousand, what more can he get out of the, but the kingdom? He's after my kingdom. So this misunderstanding caused Saul to go into a, a rage, if you would. It, 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 Saul chased David for 12 years. I tell my pastor this morning, sometimes we don't understand the years that people go through things. In my life, for the last 19 years, I've flown under the radar. I've chosen not to rise up. I've chosen not to get up there and try to be what I once was and be on TV and all these other things. I know social media has pushed us all out there. But I like because there are times when you rise up, amen, people take shots at you. Amen. They want, they want to bring up your past again. They, they want to nail you to a cross again. So I, I just found it a whole lot easier for me to stay under the radar. It's tough that way when you're an Alabama fan, but that's where I've been. Amen. So he went from king's confidant and warrior to social outcast. He was most wanted. Everybody wanted to take him out. Some misunderstandings may last from a day, a week, or 12 years, or some like Jesus may last a lifetime. You give the situation to God. Again, what's the answer? God, I am defenseless. They won't believe me. You take over. Amen. You defend me in this matter because I'm, I'm just going to stay under here. So that's what David did. He ran. If you want to understand anything about misunderstanding, check Jesus out. You talk about being misunderstood. This man came from heaven to earth in the womb of a virgin, came out here, and critics joked about his birth. They said it was illegitimate. He ain't got no daddy. His mother, surely something happened here in this situation. He was disputed about his heavenly origins when he talked about where he was from. Some said he was of the devil. They scorned his purpose. They condemned his teachings. And at the end, they called him a criminal, and then they crucified him. They missed something. They misunderstood his intentions. They misunderstood why Jesus came to earth. He came for two reasons, save sinners and whoop that devil. He's done a good job of it. Can I get an amen? John chapter 1 verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not understood it. Every now and then I will flip over and read somebody's uh, atheist post or extreme liberal post that is anti-God. And I say, God, their mind is so twisted. And, and, and I want, I, you know, and I can only read a little bit of it because I see darkness in it. I, I see uh, meanness in it. And I go back and I say, Lord, help me to understand to stay in the light because there's a lot of darkness out there. Can I get an amen? Mark chapter 3. We'll stay in the book of Mark as we move through this, and this will help you out. Are you comfortable? <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to forget? He was, I know you're saying, you was rolling, Pastor. Why don't you make me get up? It's because he was nodding. I saw you after 18 innings. They must have missed something. They missed what his intention was. So Mark chapter 3 talks about the Pharisees. You know, there were three groups of religious people, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. You read it all through your Bible. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. 
Pharisees, amen, believed in an afterlife. The Sadducees believed that whatever we did here stays here. You know, it's, when you die, you die. That's why they were sad, you see. Uh-huh. And then, then you had the Herodians. The, they were after Herod. You know, people, you, you've heard people called Trumpers, you know, because they love Trump. You know, just Herodians, they were after Herod. So you, you got to be careful. Don't let people stick a brand on you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Just be pro-life. Mark 3. Another time he went into the synagogue, that's the church, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So how many know somebody looking for something to get on you, they will get something on you? You either going to speed, you're going to burn rubber, uh, you, you're going to, that's, that's some of my stuff. Uh, you, 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 they're going to catch you sipping wine, and it was apple, apple juice, but they don't care. They're going to try to catch you doing something. So here they are, they, they're after you, they're going to catch him, doing they're going to accuse him. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus, what Jesus said to the man was, are you comfortable? And then the man got up. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or do evil? Hmm. Save life, kill. They remained silent. He looked around at them in anger. You see Jesus get upset. Deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Huh. This all happened at the beginning of his ministry. You know, when you refuse truth, you're going to need a partner. And the Pharisees refused truth, and they needed a partner to kill Jesus. And, they, and when people won't listen or believe you, they're going to try to find a partner to accuse you. They start going out. I want you to do something for me. I want you to stretch your right hand out. Just push it out. You ain't got to stick it up. Just push it out. See, your right hand in the Word of God, this implies ministry. When I reach out to people, that's ministry. Amen. My right hand is also used to bless people. In the Scripture, it was used to bless. I'm going to bless you. So I put my hand. When, you walk, when I'm walking around, I put my hand on little kids' heads all the time. I'm asking the Lord to bless them. Bless that child. Amen. There's somebody bless. It's also the hand of receiving. Flip that hand up. That's right. You don't take money like this. You get, you get it like this. Mm -hmm. This is a hand. Now, if my hand, this, this hand is also my, my hand of power. So if something happens to this hand, it's shriveled. And when God said to him, stretch out your hand, what he was doing for him is what I'm asking God to do for you right now. Give you back your ministry. Give you back the ability to receive. Give you back the ability to bless others. Amen. Give you back that power that's in your life. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Everybody say, give it back. Stretch that hand out. Father, in Jesus' name, give them back their ministry. Give them back power. Give them back the ability to receive. Amen. Let that shriveled hand go out like it's never had before. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. How do you live life like it? So he had him stand up. And when he did, he stretched out. And said, I, to, when I read these scriptures, I think to myself, what an amazing moment for revival. And yet it became a moment of confusion, a moment of, of uh, people being mad. It's weird how people get when you get your stuff back. It's weird how people get when you get your stuff back. As long as his hand was shriveled, they had to take care of him. Amen. They looked after him. He can sign up for unemployment. But now he got the ability to work again, to be fruitful again, to be fulfilling again. And they didn't even pay attention to the miracle. They were upset with Jesus doing it on the wrong day. Amen. So there was a misunderstanding that took place. Hallelujah. So the heart of the Pharisees, Jesus said their heart was hard. Their heart, it was stony. They're full of hatred. It eclipsed their understanding. It, when I look back in history and I watch documentaries on what happened in Nazi Germany, how all the people began to stand against Jews and began to hate other people, and there was a hatred put in their hearts, it bothers me. How, does a, how do millions of people follow that kind of nonsense? And yet we've seen it happen. We've seen people follow after nonsense. And their hearts were hardened just like that. The Pharisaicals, they had rules. They had rules, and you had to follow the church rules. Have you ever been in a church with rules? <laughs> That's because you've been here. 
I've been in some churches with rules. I've seen rules in churches. And some of them are not on the wall. They're not spoken, but you break one and watch a deacon jump. Amen. They, they'll get all over you for breaking them rules. Amen. How you dressed, how you came in looking. Uh, if you cut your hair, uh, you, ponytail, Frank, they'd have run you out of the churches I preached in back in the day. They wouldn't see your heart because of your ponytail. Sister, they wouldn't see your heart because of your makeup. They had rules. The Pharisees had rules. They added to the law. You know, whatever the law of the Ten Commandments, they would add to it to give a burden to people. Such as a woman was not to see her reflection on the Sabbath. A woman on the Sabbath, they could not even look in a mirror and see her reflection. So she couldn't do her hair, Tony, her makeup, Tony. She couldn't do her eyelashes, Tony. Because if she found a hair that was out of place, Tony, she'd reach up and pull that hair out, and at that moment she worked it on the Sabbath, and she broke a rule. So when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, oh, the misunderstanding took place. It went down at that moment. See, see, if they watched him because the issue, let's see if he will heal on the Sabbath. I, this, this brings me to this. They, they, they were setting him up. They're always trying to set Jesus up. So what they say, how are we going to set him up? Well, everybody in church looks like that. Well, I know a man, that get, his hand's all messed up. Let's bring him to church. So they invited the man to church because they knew if there's somebody in church with a need, Jesus would have to do something. So here he is in there with a need. They're watching him, see what he'll do. And Jesus says, stand up. Oh, that's what happened. And he stretched out his hand, and now he's healed on the Sabbath day. And they said, we got him. He broke the rules. We got him now. And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What Jesus was saying is all seven days, you know that some churches only worship on a certain day, and they get mad at you for worshiping on a Sunday. And I don't care if you do it on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He's Sabbath. He, he's the Lord of all seven days. So whenever you decide to gather and have church, He's good with it. Can I get an amen? He's good with that day. Misunderstood by his own people. Let's stay in the book of Mark chapter 3, verse 20. And then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Man, you show up, you can't even eat because the people are here. They need help. Something's going on. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's lost his mind. Now, I know none of y'all's family ever said to y'all, because you love Jesus, you've lost your mind. Because you go to church every week, you lost your mind. Because you give your tithe and often, you've lost your mind. Amen. You've lost, you pray into an unseen God, you've lost your mind. Amen. This is what they did. They went after Jesus. They said, he's lost his mind. It's such a large crowd gathered. That meant they're going to have a time of ministry. They couldn't eat. Then his family heard about this. Well, they heard about what? What heard about what? What, 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 did, what was it they heard about? Jesus has quit his day job in the carpenter shop. He's got 12 dudes following after him. One of them's a tax collector. Some are Roman haters. One has a reputation as a thief. Other ones are smelly fish, fishermen. So he's made the Pharisees fight mad with this right-handed feller. Amen. And now look how skinny he's got. He's got skinny because he's got this saying, I have food you know not of. So he's going out, which was, and I, I love this. I love that phrase, by the way. I have food you know not of. There are spiritual things you can eat that will keep you physically uh, fed. I'm just telling you. There are times that I'm doing things I feel like for God, I don't have time to eat. Amen. I don't do uh, morning, noon, and day. I just go until I, I'm too hungry, and then I got to eat. But I just, I, I got food you know not of. Doing the will of God will bless you and nourish you. Amen. It'll do something to you. So they went out to take charge of him. For they said, he's out of his mind. Now, he, he, that town, the hometown crowd has mistaken his passion for his loss of insanity. There are times that uh, I, I, I know what fanaticism is. I know, what fanat I know what fanatics are like. I know when people get, when they tip over the edge. Now, some tip over the edge just for a moment and they come back. Some tip and you'll never see them again. They will tip over and they're gone. So I understand that. But on the flip side, 
There are some people that look at your passion for God, your passion for prayer, your passion for the Word of God. They look at you like somehow you've tipped over the edge. You've gone a little bit crazy. Amen. You, you're just not doing the right thing. You're acting so much different that, that, than you should. And at that, they missed something. They thought he lost his mind. So his family, they literally said, they, Jesus lost his mind. Now, then the preachers show up. Woo! Let family, okay, I, Jesus didn't even talk to him about it. He just stayed outside. Verse 22 says, and the teachers of the law, they came down from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem's the headquarters of a lot of religious places. So they came down from headquarters, and they said, you know what? We've observed Jesus, and we believe he is possessed by Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub is another name for Satan. Beelzebub is the name you give uh, the word, the definition of Beelzebub is Lord of the Flies. Now, ain't just any flies. Have you ever seen dung out anywhere? You ever seen dung? Y'all know what I mean by dung. You see dung out in the cows leave dung, horses leave dungs, dogs leave dungs. Cats, cats hide at theirs in the house. Y'all let them do it in the house. Amen. But, but, but wherever they, wherever they are, they, you see flies get on it. And they, them big green flies. Can you see them big green flies? That, so don't big green flies, that, that's, that's the word for Beelzebub, Lord of the big green dung flies. <laughs> I want to go somewhere with that thought right now. Because this is what they, this is the word for Satan. He's Lord of the big... Steamy pile. So if you're not serving God, then you must be serving Satan. And if you're serving Satan, you're a big pile. No, boy. <laughs> so Jesus called them. And he spoke to them. They said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. He's, he is a demon, and he's driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them, amen, in parables. He said, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, what king, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. That's why it's important to agree. And, he, and if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. So here here they were dispatched from the headquarters of Jerusalem. These scribes, these preachers, they were to investigate Jesus. They officially concluded he is possessed by the Lord of the flies, amen, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. Jesus just stood and sat there. There are times I will let misunderstandings go. I ain't going to say nothing, but then there are times I got to say something. I got to say something. I got to clear this up. And when I have that opportunity, and that's what Jesus did here among the preachers, and that's normally who I will talk to when i got to clear something up, I will tell the preachers exactly how I feel. Jesus couldn't stop the Pharisees from plotting or his old friends from calling him crazy. But let an official, quote-unquote, preacher call him demon-possessed. Now he's got to say something. He's got to deal with their stupidity and their lack of understanding. And he said, one devil can't cast out another devil. Amen. Kingdoms that aren't connected, uh, that are divided, families that are divided, businesses that are divided, they can't stand. So get on the right um, signal. What am I looking for here? Me, with each other. Wavering. Thank you. Very good work. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's keep going. Uh, misunderstood by your own posse. Then Jesus, verse 31. Then Jesus' mom, his brothers, arrived standing outside. They sent someone to call him. <laughs> He's in the house. Mom and the brothers are outside. They're not even going in the house. They yelled, somebody go in and get him. Amen. They, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around, and they told him, your mom and your brothers are outside looking for you. Hold on. Why ain't mama coming in here? Never be ashamed of anybody who just wants to serve God. Yet there's a moment there they're thinking, oh, my God, in just, in just one chapter, Jesus, look what all you've done. You've upset the Pharisees by getting a man to stretch out his hand. 
you, you, you upset uh, the rest of the preachers from Jerusalem. They come down. You know how much we love them preachers from Jerusalem. Amen. We, we look after them. It's, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. We really make sure we give them all the best of everything. New clothes, nice shoes, a Madova watch. Amen. We look after them preachers from Jerusalem. And here you are telling them that you can worship on any day of the week. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I don't know what we're going to do with you. Somebody go in there and get that boy. Somebody go in there and bring him out. Misunderstood by his own family. Amen. So when it, some believe the reason that Jesus' family stood outside and called for him was because they were convinced, again, he lost his mind. They were like the rest of the family. He lost his mind. You know, it's like going, out, come home with us, Jesus. We'll get your job back at the carpenter shop. Everything's going to be all right. Just quit this nonsense running with these 12 guys. You know, so, okay, so you got one miracle under your belt. And then, you know, I, I know. But, you know, Jesus had to look at his mom every now and then and say, Mom, I know you're struggling with what I'm doing, but can I help you remember that you were a virgin? Do you remember the miracle, Mom, that brought me? from heaven to earth. Sometimes you've got to remind people that they were also a part of a miracle years ago, that they were part of a work in God. You worked for God 20 years. Uh, I used to teach Sunday school pastors. I mean, now I don't want to do it. They would just come to church and sit here. Do you remember what you did for them children back when you taught Sunday school? Some of them have gone on to be pastors, evangelists. Some of them are running big businesses now. You, you were doing something then. Don't, don't start, don't forget what God has done in your life over the years. You've got to, re I went back over a bunch of old pictures the other day. I got a new laptop because my other one crashed and so they put everything on. So I'm going through pictures. I'm seeing pictures of you. I'm seeing pictures of, of how we started this church. There was a blue, ugly foam platform here that stayed out here. The, the, the only thing that we left in here was these ugly blue pews. But other than that, we fixed this whole building up, painted everything, put the ceiling in. Even, I remember what this place looked like when we started on it. I remember being out there at the ranch with air conditioner stuck up in the window. Hey, Amen. It being so hot in the summer, I had to run outside as soon as church was over, just catch my breath and get ready for the next crowd. It'd be so cold in the wintertime. Hey, Amen. Everybody looked like rotisserie granny standing back there by that propane heater. Hey, Amen. Just warming up, trying to get one. But, but only one person could get there, Kenny, because the whole building was packed, but only one heater in the back of the building. I remember those times. So I'll go back and I see the miracles of what God has done in our lives over and over and over and over again. Sometimes you got to say, Mama, do you remember what God did in your life? Now quit giving me such a hard time about healing people. Amen, about doing the will of God in my own life. Amen, what God wanted me to do. So Jesus asserted his kinship with all who do the will of God. I love this. Verse 33, he said, who are my mother? They went in and said, your mama wants you outside. Your brothers want you outside. Listen to me again. Mama and who? Mama and who? Come on, you Catholics. Mama and who? Who? If Jesus had brothers, then guess what happened to mother? She did not stay a virgin. You can celebrate her virginity at the time Jesus was born. But after that, give her her kudos and let her have some children. Can I get an Amen. So she got kids now. So mom and brothers, by the way, Jesus had sisters too. Mom and brothers outside. And Jesus said, hold on, let me just tell you the truth here. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. I want to tell you who they are. They looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Oh, I read that. I said, God, welcome to the family. Amen. Everybody in this house that does the will of God are my brothers and my sisters. Why y'all call each other brothers and sisters? Because we all doing the will of God. Can I get an amen? We're doing the best we can. So he made this large family. Let me start closing here. When you're misunderstood, here's what I want you to do. Ask who? Ask who? Amen. Consider the source. Try to see through their eyes. Why, why do they misunderstand? Ask why? Examine the reasons. Is it something I'm doing without realizing, a blind spot, or is it the other person given to always being negative? You, you've got to ask these questions. Amen. I, uh, I realized that I was saying the wrong thing, for matter of fact, for quite a while. I would use the phrase, I don't care. My wife would ask me something. I said, I don't care. I'm not being mean. She said, where are you going to eat? I don't care. I don't care. I can eat anything but liver. I can eat anywhere. 
as long as it don't just serve liver. So I, I don't care. But I realized that those three words became a misunderstanding of a lack of love, a, a lack of caring, if you would, when I say I don't care. So I had to change it to it don't matter. You see how much nicer those three words are? Thank you, Marie. Amen. Uh, I can say I don't care, and that hurt her feelings. But now I got to say it don't matter. So I catch it myself because there was a misunderstanding. So I, I don't mind being a little more transparent with you to tell you that uh, there are times it don't matter to me. It don't matter. Amen. Well, you, there are things that matter that are kingdom. They, they're serious. They matter. Then there are the things that don't matter. Amen. Which vehicle are you going to take? We got six of them. Pick one. It don't matter. Amen. If it's a pretty day, it matters. I'm riding my motorcycle. Amen. So you, you just, you, you gotta, that, these are things that are important that you've got to learn. Okay, now, is it a blind spot? Um, all my vehicles have blind spot mirrors on them because, honest to God, I didn't do it for me. <laughs> I have others in my family that drive, and it matters. But those are important to have those. And then ask what? Not just who, not why, or, or what. What? Ask what? What lessons have I learned? That? How can I profit? Did I learn something about myself that needs changing? Yes, I did. So who, why, and what? But they're useless without forgiveness. You've got to learn to forgive. When we withhold forgiveness, we become prisoner in our own self-made selves of bitterness. The person who coexists with misunderstanding and bitterness is miserable. If I misunderstand something, I just want to clear it up. Amen. And if you misunderstand me, let's clear it up. Let forgiveness flow between us so we can still have relationship. Can I get an amen? Because oftentimes, these misunderstand they ruin businesses. They destroy churches. Amen. They affect people so many, uh, so, so many ways. I, I don't want to be, I want to clear this thing up. Up and make sure it's good. When you get, when we came to Crosby, there was misunderstandings. There was. There were people that thought we should not. I should not come back to Crosby. Did you know that? Amen. That somehow I had signed papers that said that I was not allowed to come back to Crosby after leaving Crosby. I signed papers with a bank for a loan, and then when that loan was rolled over to another bank. I was no longer under that law anymore. And yet, though, when I came over here, there was gossip, there was criticism, there was backbiting, there was, a, he's, he, he's not a man of integrity and all this other stuff. And I'm looking, what are y'all talking about? I signed something with a bank. It was been 10 years. If y'all ain't figured this thing out at your own church after 10 years, I told a group of pastors this week that, that looked at me, they were talking about a new church coming to town. I'm glad this new church is coming to town. There's always a new church coming to town. There's always new bells and whistles to go try out. Can I get an amen? I'm going to say this again. You find your pastor, you find your church. If that's your pastor, go. That, that's just how I feel. That's what I see in the Word of God. Amen. People follow leadership. They don't just go to buildings. So, so it doesn't bother me. So these pastors, I've gotten texts from several of them. They're upset about New Church. I'm not upset. This is a big town now. We done grown up. We chicken filleting. <laughs> Hello, world. We moving on up. We four-laning. Amen. Another church will come. Let another church come. That's good. That's all. We got to reach people. We're not against each other. Amen. So I, I, so I tell them that. Don't, don't be bothered by all them. Don't, don't let them misunderstand me. But I want to tell you something. I, you know my successes and failures. I'm talking to these pastors this week. You know my successes and failures. It's ever before you guys. You know all about it. You've talked about it among yourselves. Amen. So I'm going to tell you right now, we're here to win people for Jesus. Amen. We're putting the past behind us and going forward. We're not going to stand back anymore. Amen. So I, I don't have no reverse in me. Hallelujah. So let me start closing here. When you give a situation over to God and you say, I'm defenseless, understand, you misunderstood. They didn't understand your intentions. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm right, but they'll never believe me. You take over, God. You got to. He will perform the most incredible feats as he glorifies his name in your life. We grow through misunderstandings. That's how we grow. Amen. And through it, we come to see the Lord as our defense. I would say let tongues wag. God will take care of it. Can I get an amen? Amen. I want to close with this. Give me a little soft music back there, Robert. I, I, I kicked the musician out this week. He's in Tulsa. If you've ever felt misunderstood, stand.
I want to read a scripture over you. I want you to catch this. You'll be misunderstood again. Parent, if you're a parent, you'll be misunderstood. The kids did not understand your intentions of why you said no. They thought you didn't love them no more. You didn't like them. You said, no, you wrecked three cars. That's it. No. Grandparents, guardians, if you're a business owner, you can't, you can't tell them everything that's going on behind the decision that you made. In the church, sometimes I can't tell you everything behind the scenes that are going on. I just got to tell you this is the decision we've made. Amen. And we go forth. We're not here to air a laundry. We're here to move on. Amen. So, so when I read the scripture, this is David running from Saul. He's been misunderstood. They're trying to take his life. And David says this, and I, I read this over your lives right now. Lord, I want you to keep everybody that stands from the hands of the wicked. God, my prayer is that you would protect everybody in this house from men and women of violence who plan to trip their feet. Proud men and women who have hidden snares for them. They have spread about the cords, the discords of their net and have set traps for the people of this house. Selah. Lord, I say to you, you are our God. Hear us, O oh Lord. Hear our cry for mercy. Forgive us when we've done wrong, when we've misunderstood other people's intentions. Sovereign Lord, you are a strong deliverer. You shield our head in the day of battle. This is my prayer for this house, that you do that for these people. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, give God praise. Did you know the disciples misunderstood Jesus? When they saw him come to earth, they saw the miracles, the lepers healed. Uh, they saw people raised from the dead, the widow of Nain's son raised from the dead, Lazarus raised from the dead. They saw so many great things, eyes open, ears open, arms stretched out. And hallelujah. They saw men get up and walk. They saw all these miracles. They were looking for a, uh, <laughs> yeah, a Savior. But they were looking for a lion. They thought he would come back and kick the butts of the Romans. Amen. Set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and rule. They missed it. What he came is as a lamb. A lamb to be slaughtered. His blood for our sins. Amen. In other words, the Jewish people at that time, they only thought about themselves. They didn't think about the rest of us Gentiles that we were coming along a couple thousand years later, and we were going to need a Savior too. So God grafted us in and gave us the same blessings of Abraham. Amen. So if you bless us, you bless, you curse us, you curse. We got the same blessing working. Can I get an amen? Amen. We just got to believe that. Misunderstood. They didn't see. They, they were looking for the lamb. <laughs> I'm sorry. They were looking for the lion, and they got the lamb. But when he comes back again, he done been the lamb. He coming back as the lion. Amen. Amen. And a group of people that understand that, that tribe becomes lions. So you are the lions of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Reach over, grab your neighbor's billfold, grab a seat.